Welcome and thanks for joining us for this virtual career speakers session. We're celebrating Hispanic Heritage Month by interviewing outstanding professionals in their field. Today, we're going to visit with Captain Elaine Moya and Sergeant Daniel Torres. Captain Moya is currently over the Investigations Division of the Victoria Police Department, and Sergeant Torres is over the Crime, crime Scene Investigation Unit and also part of the SWAT team. We appreciate both um, Elaine and Daniel for taking time to tell us about their career journeys and um, educational background and any future plans that they may have. The session is being recorded and it will be available in YouTube shortly. Um, if you have any questions, please type them into the chat. And without further ado, I'm going to turn the um, session over to Elaine and Daniel. Well, thank you, Kathy, for, for having us on. Um, it is a great thing to be a part of. I know with being from Victoria and the upbringings that we've had to grow up in the school system and now to be able to serve our community is a great thing to be a part of. I wanted to first start with Sergeant Torres and his journey and how long he's been with the department and what brought him to uh, law enforcement. So I want to get Sergeant Torres to talk a little bit about that. Hey, hello, uh, I'm Daniel Torres. I'm a sergeant here at the Victoria Police Department. I've been here a little over 15 years. <clears throat> uh, I started back in 2006 with the Victoria Police Department, but I originally started off my law enforcement career in 1997. Uh, with the Jackson County Sheriff's Office. Uh, I was born in Galveston, but raised here in Victoria. Went through all throughout my uh, school career here in Victoria. Um, and, uh, but when I started in Jackson County, I started as a jailer uh, with the ambition to be on the street and uh, serve the community a little more. Um, I went to a couple of small departments prior to coming here. Uh, some see it as uh, something bad. I've seen it as something that helped me be able to interact with the community and the people more because in the small towns, that's what you have. You have the, the community and, uh, uh, <clears throat> and the respect and you get to bring that to the bigger town like Victoria, when I started here, I was able to uh, hit the ground running. I already knew the job. I knew how to interact with the people. Uh, basically, when I started here in Victoria, all I had to learn was the computer system. And uh, so, you know, I, I was grateful for that and grateful for the opportunity to work here in Victoria. Um, when I started here in Victoria, the pay was good. The pay is great now. It's a lot better starting off. Um, but as soon as I started working here, I knew that they had a SWAT team and I knew that's what I wanted to do. And I had a military background uh, in the United States Army Infantry, Infantry Sergeant. So I brought that to the SWAT team and I tried out, I made it. And after years as a, as a team member, I finally made it to as one of the team leaders. Uh, I have my own team that I assist in training and they help me, they train me too to be a better leader and a follower. Uh, I listen to them openly and and take their input and that that's what uh, I believe makes me better at the job that I do. But uh, throughout my career here at the Victoria Police Department, I uh, started off in patrol uh, there was an investigation spot open. I applied for that. I got it. Started off in child sex crimes initially, went to property crimes, and then uh, the assault team, which they work from everything from, you know, a misdemeanor assaults all the way up to murders, homicides, robberies. I got to do that a total of eight years in investigations, and I finally got promoted to sergeant. What which, year was that? 2000, uh, it's been four years. Okay. <laughs> it's been four and a half years, something like that. <clears throat> but it's been so fast the last four years, two years on patrol as a patrol sergeant, mm -hmm. two years in the crime scene unit as a supervisor. That time has gone so fast. Um, 
but I was grateful for my two years back on the street as a supervisor because I got reconnected with the community, with the officers. After eight years of being in investigations, you become disconnected with, with the patrolmen and what they're going through nowadays. And so those two years brought me back to their level, you know, my mindset. Now I, I can relate to, you know, what they're going through. Whereas most people that have been out of off of patrol, they don't see what the patrolman sees. And it's, it's, it's more difficult now to do your job, but you are given the tools and the training to make it work. And uh, what I would add to that, Kathy, is that, you know, when we first started in law enforcement and I started as a civilian in 1999 and then became an officer in 2000. So I've been a peace officer for 21 years. And so when we, when I started, I want to say our authorized strength of law enforcement officers was about 105, 107, somewhere around there. And over the years, obviously, the community has grown. And, you know, we've got Loop 463 that came, you know, later on that kind of made us feel like the big town. Um, and, and then we've increased some of our authorized strength. So we are now at authorized strength at 130. Do I think personally that we should have more? Yes. You know, we could always use more officers, but that has shown the increase in the city and in our department of what, uh, you know, we're going towards and, and moving towards. So um, that's also a good thing to, to let people know that all walks of life, male, female, go into this profession and they find the areas that they are good at that they can really improve in and make a big impact and that could be where they can spend their career on patrol and and serving the the calls of service so they can go to traffic safety unit and work the um fatalities and or major serious bodily injury type uh crashes and then you can also go into investigations where you become a detective on the different divisions like sergeant torres went through and of course we have canine and we have the motorcycles so we have a variety that if someone is interested in those areas um, and they really want to um, you know get that knowledge and make a career out of it victoria is a really good place to have that um, training that that foundation where you can you can really grow with the department so right now I, I can say we have about five openings so we're always utilizing the recruitment officer to do recruitment and go to um, job fairs go to the police academies that are in session sometimes we send people to go to the academy and we pay their their tuition and we actually pay them while they attend the academy those come out, usually come open once a year through our department, sometimes twice. But really, um, we like to have all walks of life, like I said, but we also like homegrown and we like Victorians that we know has a lot of family here because they they tend to stay here throughout their whole career. We know there have been people that go to different agencies or they move for different reasons for family and things of that nature. So that comes with any job and any um, agency that has has seen that throughout the nation. But we also want to look at our up and coming Victorians that are coming through that can make a career out of here. And we have civilians that work in his division, which is the crime scene unit technicians. And they go to a lot of calls where they, and training that they get to collect evidence, take photos, um, work with the lab and DPS. So there's a lot of of versatility here. And it's only been within the last three to five years that we've had a crime analyst here that actually analyzes the types of reports and, and crime that goes on and looks at all of our data. So that utilize, helps and utilize, we utilize that to um, for our advantage on where to send our officers in the city or where we tend to see um, an increase in let's say, um, traffic crashes. There are certain intersections that we will pull that information and send traffic safety officers and patrol officers to those areas at certain times to monitor to make sure that a lot of it is contributed by running red lights. And um, when they go enforce that and know that we're there and 
conduct traffic stops on people that are that that are doing those um, infractions. It's more of a message and education because the end goal is to reduce the number of crashes that happen at our high volume areas. Um, so that just kind of gives you a whole kind of sense of our department and different areas. We have case prep clerks who actually work with the detectives who put the cases together to send to the district attorney's office. Um, and we have clerks that also help with our training unit when we do our hiring and recruiting. So there's civilian staff and there's licensed staff, and um, they're all part of our team that makes it worth all the work that is put in through the officers and command staff and everyone here. We, they put it all together for um, a work product that we serve our community. Let me know if you have any questions, Kathy, because I'll just jump on to another um, topic. All right, we don't have any questions so far, so we'll let you both proceed on. Okay, um, and I wanted to also touch a little bit, and you know, we'll go both uh, Sergeant Torres and I. But I know that an interest has that we what we have seen is um, you know being able to be part of SWAT and the training that they do. They do a lot of training, so I'm I'm so glad Sergeant Torres is here to talk about that because that is a very important. Um, aspect of this department when we have high crisis areas or, or we have things that are going on that need um, that expertise type of response. So I'll let Sergeant Torres talk a little bit about their SWAT training and what that entails. Our SWAT team right now, when I started the, on the SWAT team, uh, there was 11, 12 of us, a supervisor and some senior officers, total up to about 12 guys. Um, now we are, we have a, our manpower is that we have 20, you know, 20 officers, uh, 21, if you include the captain, but there's 20, we have a Lieutenant, four or five sergeants, and then the rest are, uh, you know, entry or, um, a sniper on the sniper team. Uh, with that being said, we have two teams within the SWAT team. We have the entry team. We got the sniper team. Uh, we have a sergeant and a, and an, another soon to be lieutenant that are going to run. They run the sniper uh, sniper team, and myself and uh, a few other sergeants and lieutenant fetters. We we trained uh, the entry team. Uh, we split up our teams: green team, gold team, and. Uh, uh, we train on different dates right now due to COVID. And that's one of the, uh, the impacts COVID has had on the SWAT team. Uh, we're training in smaller elements, but you know we try to mirror each other's training. That way we're both on the same page. Um, and our training is, is every other week, eight hours a day uh, with some physical fitness in it. And this is a separate uh, job assignment that they have, they have their primary duties of what, like he does, the crime scene unit uh, supervisor, and on the side when they get called out, or that's why they have to maintain the training of wearing the hat of a SWAT operator. Yes, and you know, and one of the ways that we that we divided the teams was each, each unit has is like from one company, it's a, a company and B company. That way when they're on, they're on their days off for training and we're not interfering with their work schedule. Um, and we and we also have implemented a TAC medic, a tactical medic, which we get from the fire department. They have five TAC medics and a supervisor, which come and train with us. Uh, we do all sorts of training, you know, injured officer, downed officer, Stuff that we do to help the medics train in a high stressful situation. And that's one thing with the SWAT team, we train constantly high stress. That way, when we actually get a call out, we're in a stressful situation, we can, we can continue to think and operate. Uh, so, and that helps every SWAT member on the street. Uh, when they encounter a high, stre high stressful situation, you know, quickly evolving, they can keep up with it. Uh, they can make great sound decisions that will at least get the supervisor there to take over 
or the supervisor is going to allow the SWAT member to continue under his supervision. Uh, but I, I've noticed that when I went back to patrol as a sergeant, it was, you know, I encountered a very high stressful situation and it was a smooth, it was, to me, it went smooth though. I didn't feel like I was stressed. I was able to make sound decisions. Was it like a man with a gun or? It, it was it... a double homicide. Okay. And, uh, and I was able to relay information to the uh, <laughs> incident commander and we worked well together. Neither one of us were, you know, high pitched or anything like that. We were level. And we were able to make the proper decisions to come to a good outcome where everybody that was involved was arrested and identified and prosecuted. Yeah. And just to go back a little bit for anyone that's interested um, in law enforcement and what it takes to be an officer. Um, and I believe you went to the Victoria College Police Academy, yes. right? Um, so the way I did it is I was a civilian um, employee with the department and I put in to go um, be sponsored to attend the Victoria College Police Academy because our department will do that, like I said earlier, once a year, sometimes twice a year, we will open up a hiring process or a hiring phase where we will have civilians that are not licensed put in to um, be hired so that our department can send you to the police academy and they people can do it two ways they can go that way where they can send themselves to the police academy and pay for it and then we will also do a, a recruitment with our recruitment officer but the way i did it and did you do it too that way correct or did you I, send yourself i sent myself okay so um the way i did it is i went through the whole process and some of it is being able to you know do an agility course um, if you are in good shape, which that would consist of making sure that you maintain your running, um, you have your your ratio of, you know, you're in good standing with your height ratio of your weight, um, but that you're in good uh, physical fitness, then going over a six foot wall or a four foot wall and, and doing a, a sprint under what 90 seconds 90 seconds is is um it shouldn't be that difficult but that's something to work towards now if you're going to be a civilian going to the police academy there is a mile or a mile and a half mile run cooper standard that you have to do under so many minutes depending on your things like oh, just over 16 minutes okay it so which to me it's very easy to do but if you're not used to running that might be something you could set a goal in if that's eventually what you're wanting to go into um, and then you have to do certain push-ups and sit-ups, I think is some of that requirement. Yeah. But being in good physical fitness, um, standing and maintaining that even, you know, through your junior high, high school years, and then eventually if you want to go into law enforcement, you're that much ahead when it comes to having to uh, put in for this position. So once we do all that and then we do an interview, so you really wanna pay attention on how to conduct yourself in an interview. I know that there are classes being offered. I know you can go to um, some job shadowing. You can do different things that are out there that prepare you for conducting yourself and how to conduct yourself in a professional manner in, in, in a professional interview. And so those are things that you should just kind of absorb and take in and even ask people that are in these positions myself or Sergeant Torres, um, of how to prepare for, because there, believe it or not, there's a certain way you should present yourself, always be in a professional manner, always look people in the eye, shake their hand if you're able to, COVID kind of throws that kink a little bit, but, um, but to always answer honestly, and a lot of it is from within like your work, uh, your life experience, any work experience, and um, your truth as far as where you come from and where you stand on your beliefs. So a lot of that make up um, who, what we're looking for, the questions that are created. And it also has a lot to do with accountability and, and being professional and how you act or present yourself in the, in the public's eye through social media, through Facebook, through all these other uh, social media platforms 
believe it or not, our department, when we do a background investigation on any of our applicants, that's one of the things we dive into. And um, that tells a lot about a person, person's character and their personality and how their true views are. So pay attention to things like that whenever you are deciding on how you want to share something, if you want to post something, because when we grew up, we didn't have that. You know, we had Polaroids, either you got the picture or you didn't. <clears throat> you had the little camera that used a slide, you know, to rewind or to fast forward to the next picture slide, and then you had to send it to go get it developed. So we didn't have that, you know, take, retake, and take this picture and all these apps that make your face look funny. Um, that that's just you know this is just where we are now and so if if it's a career that you want to go into for law enforcement and you want to have your best foot forward now's the time just to make those choices that are going to reflect you basically long term because there are people that do make mistakes they do run into the law or they they get into something criminal and there are things that keep you from being a law enforcement officer. You can't have like a misdemeanor um, on your record for last five, years. five or 10 years. It used to be 10, but I think it's five now. <clears throat> so you have to pay attention on how your driving record is and how your criminal record is. It's very important. Um, and a lot of people don't realize too, as far as getting into the young, you know, 18, 19 young adults, um, your credit. When, when we uh, have people put in for this application, they can be stellar at everything. And first and thing they check is that credit they report. They check the credit report to see how you as a person are responsible on paying your debt back. So, and I know people get credit cards or a credit card to build their credit where they eventually want to go and, you know, purchase, make a big purchase. And I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I mean, I, I know people do that for that reason, but it's the responsibility that you have to follow through with that whenever they do a credit check. And it's not maybe not just our department in our city. It could be anywhere. That is a telltale sign on how you hold yourself responsible or how accountable you are. So those are just different things to look at that if you want to look into um, a career with um, a law enforcement agency or Victoria Police Department, those are the things that I know that we go through and we look at. Um, I did spend three years in our training unit where it was hiring and recruiting. She hired me. I was, I was one of the people that were there when he was coming through <clears throat> and look what a great investment that turned out to be. Um, but we rec make recommendations to command staff and they do background checks on, on people like Sergeant Torres um, that anyone's coming through. And you know, you, it's the chief's ultimate decision on whether or not he, he or she wants to make that job offer. So those are the different areas. You know, I've been on patrol as a senior off, as an officer and then senior officer and we're at different parts of the city. Um, that's just part of getting to know your job and knowing how to connect with the community. And then um, I was able to work internal affairs and become a public information officer where I had to get in front of a camera and tell the public and the news media what's going on. So different things and you and you learn and try to improve and get better and and understand the process. But um, it's been it's been really rewarding to actually at the end of the day, we are serving the citizens of Victoria. And if that's what you're into to giving back and have a giving heart and want to help, um, especially the place that I know for me personally, where I grew up, I can turn around and serve the community that I grew up. Um, because I went to Roland, I went to Howe, I went to Victoria High. So those, you know, I, I now that it's East and West and Victoria High is Liberty, the, you know, we remember all that, that, that we can give back to the community and, and for any friends and family members that we grew up with. That's a good thing you brought up background. I, I grew up uh, Twin City, Silver City, uh, before I left my mama's house. And uh, here at the police department, there's people from every background. You know, you, you had me, who I, you know, where I grew up. And throughout the whole city is where, you know, everybody's from. And we've got out-of-towners from the Valley. Mm -hmm. We got one from all the way from West Virginia. And so it's a very diverse group here. We all get along. Uh, we use each other's strengths to help each other out on the street. 
uh, you know, I knew people down and, you know, on the on major crimes, you know, we go to these neighborhoods. I'm from there. You know, I was able to uh, keep the crowd calm and stuff like that. We go up north, you know, I may not be the one to go to the crowd. It may be somebody else, you know, or we go to a different part of the city. Everybody has their strength in, in, in how they can uh, take care of stuff and, and help you out and you help them out with their stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's not all about one person going to take care of a call. We do it as a team. Most calls require a, uh, a a secondary unit. And some, when I was on the street as, they, as a swing sergeant, which is an extra sergeant <clears throat> that stays on the street, I went to as many calls as I could. And so you would have three of us there at one time for, sometimes it could be, you know, a class C theft, but there was three of us there, you know. So, you know, and we try to help each other out, you know, because that class C theft can quickly burst into something else mm -hmm. as soon as you turn your back. And that's why a lot of training goes um, with our department. We do monthly training, we do firearms training, we do scenario building clearing. There's a lot of training that these officers go through every year. But before I forget, I also wanted to say when you talked about a stressful and staying calm, we have civilians, they are licensed dispatchers. You do have to become licensed and we, we um, send you to the training for it. But to be a dispatcher and to have the calm voice to answer a frantic 911 call of something major happening or that they're going through, um, it takes a unique type of person to do that. And we have uh, men and women that are dispatchers here at our department. And I will say we are hiring. So um, that's one thing to look into for our dispatchers because they have to go through so much training to be able to handle the radio um, to dispatch an officer to a certain area. They go through training on answering the 911 and where to send the officers. And then they also go through training of fire and EMS. Do you need a, you know, the fire department? Do you need medical? And they have to get that training to send the medics. And that is a very stressful job. And I think it was just one day that I tried to, um, uh, dispatch an officer. I was in there for something and I said, let me, let me just try it. And I remember trying to hit the button with your foot. So the <laughs> microphone would come on and I like went blank. I was like, uh, who am I calling? So you're just in charge of all the officers. And then when the officers run traffic, they're radioing in on their radio. They're talking to that dispatcher who is pushing it all in. Um, and so the dispatchers have to be able to type very fast and accurate. And I will say this to anyone that's ever even thinking twice about not paying attention to typing or any kind of typing class or any opportunity that you have. Typing is very important when it comes to being a police officer, being a dispatcher, even a crime scene tech, anything in law enforcement. If you know how to type really fast and accurately, you are way ahead of a lot of other people because the typing, and I remember taking it in high school, my freshman my freshman year it offered, and I don't know what they're <clears> offering <throat> now, but if you can do it online, or if you can do it on your spare time, even though I know it could be very painful sometimes because I remember sitting in class, that has been one of my greatest benefits of taking that typing one and typing two class and now being able to for all these years is when you have when we go to a call or someone gets arrested or there's a crime that was committed we have to turn around and when we first started we had to write it out and then we got computers in our car so then you have to type it and if you're a typer with just like this it's going to take you forever but if you're a fast typer and you can get all everything in then you're that much quicker and ready to get back on the street to go to the next call. So that's very important to have those type of skills. If you already have it, good. I know that I speak broken Spanish. Very. <laughs> very broken or very little. I do speak some. Um, we Spanish class, if you can go through them and understand, because we would take Spanish in, for law enforcement and understand the certain verbiage that you would have to use when talking to people about their insurance, about, you know, if they're going to be under arrest. 
Um, but I also, if you can pick up that Spanish now and be that bilingual officer, because we do have officers that speak very good Spanish, and we actually have some that aren't even Hispanic and speak Spanish, and they will be called over to a call because of, of um, that barrier of that translation. We need somebody to translate. And, and when you speak Spanish, you not only help our department, the sheriff's office called me, mm -hmm. DPS called me. There were several times I had to translate for ATF, DEA. Yeah. And yes, you're going to be called into court. And he, <laughs> he speaks better than I do. And I'm going to say, Kathy, yo hablo nomás un poquito. <laughs> and he speaks way better. So you're, you're, you're being bilingual, great tool. Yes. Uh, yes. Especially and, we're in South Texas. Yeah. And you know, especially if you get the you get assigned to the to the highway, mm -hmm. you can work interdiction out there, and you'll be able to converse with uh, the motorists, right. and, and you can pick up on what they're saying, what they're telling the other people in the car. I mean, being bilingual is is a great asset not only yes. for you to help you in your career, but right. to help the the department out in the streets. And I will say this, I I. My parents both spoke Spanish and my mom spoke Spanish and English. And there's a lot of people in Victoria or motorists, the people that you interact with. A lot of them do speak some English. It's just <laughs> broken English and they prefer Spanish. And so when I would try, when I would get called because I was the next closest thing that would could get some um, kind of communication, I would I remember going to many calls. And I would tell them in my broken Spanish, uh, que necesitas, que es tu preguntas. Like I would ask them, what's the question that they have? And then they would ask me. And of course, there might be a word or two that I didn't understand. And I would tell them in my broken Spanish that yo, yo no hablo mucho, no más un poquito, como es la palabra. And I would just try to piece it for them. And then they would ultimately start speaking in broken English. But I think a lot of it is they just felt more comfortable speaking in Spanish. And of course, it's their- Because you're trying. Right. You're, you're trying to be on their level. Yes. And so I remember I would go to it and they would speak their English and it would be it would be good. And I think it's because they just would feel comfortable. And so part of that was putting them at ease and trying to give them my Spanish and then still understanding it um, helped. And, it, and so I'm still working on it. I'm still trying to get better, but- it's it's a challenge but if you can do that now and you can get it and you can get your parents grandparents relatives to talk to you in spanish because that's what i tell my grandfather i would say no mas en, en espanol um i would tell my grandpa i said uh I, I don't even know how i'd say it i'd say dime preguntas en espanol no mas and he would tell me and then i would try to answer back to him so the constant practice is is good to do kathy do you want to touch on anything else that maybe we didn't touch on that you think that we should? That was a good overview. Um, a couple of questions that I had that kind of came to mind that students might be interested in. Um, have either of you ever had to fire your weapon on duty? And what, what does that lead to as far as um, follow up? I know it's right. probably very dependent on the scenario. While on duty, I've never had to fire my weapon. Pulled it out. Plenty of plenty times. of times to have your uh, weapon ready. But never had to fire it. No. Yeah, I'm not going with them now. Definitely, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. You also in the positions that you both have been in, um, you talked about some stressful situations and remaining calm and being prepared. But I'm thinking some of the things that police officers witness and go through, what are some of the interpersonal skills or specific things that, that you do to, um, after, in the aftermath of that for, for, your, for yourself, to, to take care of yourself, um, some self-care after you witness um, very horrific events? Mm -hmm. one, one of the main things that I do and as you, I, you talk about it yeah. with, with the other officers, you talk about what happened. That helps relieve, I personally, it helps relieve some of the emotion that I have. I, I get to let it out, mm -hmm. you know? 
uh, keeping it bottled in and not telling anybody that something bothered you, uh, that, that will hurt you more than anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, whether it's that one officer, one friend that you, that, that I confide in, uh, go out and talk to them and let them know, you know, what went down, how it went down. And you just, you, your feelings come out in the way you talk. You don't necessarily have to tell that person, you know, oh, it made me feel like this. They can hear it in your in, in your story when you're telling it. And then that helps you get, get through some stuff. And part of it too is, you know, it's going to be different if we ever had to respond to something that's a family member. And we understand that when we're responding to things that are major or a fatality or a death investigation, you know, we are interacting with family members of that person. And from, I guess, from all the training that we've had and the different scenarios we've had to put through and then going through our career, it's just part of it is, you know, that you still have a task to do. You know that you are the one that's responsible for capturing the information, the, the, the follow-ups, leads, the everything that you need at a scene or at a crime scene or something that's major. And it's, it's kind of... It, you kind of have to put it on auto, autopilot where you've got to do this job, you've got to do your task. And then like Sergeant Torres saying, if it's bothering you enough, especially when it involves children or things of that nature or something that's very near and dear that kind of affected you differently, then having that outlet of talking to someone um, because it city does offer that here, but it's also good to have somebody, um, coworkers or even, you know, your family member, or your significant other that you just kind of go through the motion of talking about it. And then, and then you basically have to, you know, it's, it's, I'm not gonna say compartmentalize, but you do in a sense have to, because you deal with your emotions, but then know that you still have a job to do the next day or, or the next Um. Can you all still hear me over there? Um, I think my camera has frozen. Um, let me ask another question. Um, what if what kind of advice would you give high school students uh, the things you might have wished you could have taken in high school to help you prepare for your job? Are we back? We're back. Sorry about that. I'm not sure what happened to the electrons here. So um, just, just to finish that thought is basically officers will find different outlets to kind of decompress and to um, kind of deal with what's going on in their head and, and what they were just went through. Um, and, and it's very good to have people outside of law enforcement that you don't talk cop all the time, cop um, shop, and um, to have hobbies. And you have people that do photography, you have people who go and, you know. Coach baseball. Coach baseball, you know, they keep their mind active and going and, and find the balance. A lot of it has to do with balancing your family life and your work life. So um, that's what that's what a lot of officers um, deal with and, and um, get that partnership going as far as knowing how to do it. If you had some advice for a high school students about what type of classes to take to prepare for a career in law enforcement, I know VISD offers some criminal justice type classes, mm -hmm. but um, either to those students or to some in our outlying school districts too, uh, can you think of some classes that might be, be helpful? I know they offer some toward, sort of criminal justice classes and they have that criminal justice one and two. So those are good to get an, a, a, a sneak peek in and it gives you a baseline. Um, it's also good to make sure you get your typing down, taking those typing classes. Um, so anything in criminal justice would be good. But also um, if some people, and this has happened, off, people want to be officers, they go and become an officer and within three months, six months, or even a week, they, they realize uh, this is totally different than what I was thinking. 
So when you want to go down that road, and, and one of the things to look at to also explore is if you're 18, and I think we're starting to lift the, the riders as far as doing a ride along program, you can ride with an officer and you can kind of see what they do in during their shift, whether it's days or nights. And then you can also, um, we have a civilian police academy that we offer once a year in the spring. You can go do a CPA class that's like 12 to 6, 12, 14, 16 weeks, and they meet every. Can you still hear me, Kathy? Yes, I sure okay. can. Yes. And then they will meet every uh, once a week, and it, it introduces you to different instructors and different people like Sergeant Torres, you know, SWAT team, canine. <clears throat> crime scene unit they you get you get all these different uh presenters and you actually get to do some fun stuff too fingerprinting lifting a fingerprint um doing some mock traffic stops um but that kind of gives you like you know this is what they are up against um and then and, and so that kind of gives you that 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 view but there are other things that you can do that helps you in the long run but Sarge can you think of one of the major as the patrol supervisor you read every report that comes through that your 12, 13 officers write. One of the things I would suggest if you wanted to be a police officer, besides the typing, English, reading and writing. That way you can put together mm -hmm. a good report. A comprehensive very, report of chronological order. Detailed. Yes. Uh, and that way your words are spelled correctly, your sentence structure is yes. good. Um, it, it's very important for two reasons. One is we can read and know what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Two is when your report goes to the defense attorney and he's like, what is this? <laughs> yeah, because they'll also look at, he can't spell, he can't put a sentence, I say he, can't spell, could put a sentence together. They start looking at weaknesses that defense attorneys and can will easily attack you. attack your credibility and the way that you have captured the crime scene or your investigation. But the, the, your report is 50% of what you do, uh, you know, part of your investigation. You go out and do the investigation, then you got to put it in writing. Mm -hmm. You get to a call, you got to listen to what they say, then you got to put it in right. writing. You have to articulate the key information to put in that report to fit the elements of a crime to know that that's what you're investigating. There's a difference between a theft and a robbery. There's there's different elements that you have to make sure that fitting, but you got to make sure it's in there of your report. So great point, very good point. That that gets a lot of our officers in, in, in a little bit of a snag because we're either having to keep at them on this is how, this is how, this is how, or they somehow end up on the on the witness stand because they're testifying on a major crime and the defense attorney is really tearing them apart on their on the way that they typed and wrote their report. Good point. Yes. Yeah. So uh, in other words, um, much above and beyond tech speak and Snapchat one liners. Exactly. And on that, if as a challenge to our high schoolers. Um, go for, I'd say a day, Let's see if you can do it, turn, turn off your auto, uh, fill or auto correct on your texting and, um, send messages to people and see how much you really can spell a word or use it in the right context. I'm just saying it's, it's, it's a challenge, but it's also because the younger generation are up with technology and autocorrect and autofill. And it, it's like, why is it saying that word? You know, it, so if you turn it off, that feature on your phone. For an hour and just see how you do. <laughs> yes. You mentioned um, both of you kind of alluded to officers having to make court appearances. Mm -hmm. um, is part of your training and, and preparation to someone help you if you have to testify? Mm -hmm. Yes, one of the one of the classes that we do take as law enforcement officers is courtroom testimony. Uh, and during that class, 
you, you take it in the academy and then when you get out of the academy there's other classes you can take mm -hmm. but they, they tell you how to sit how to speak and answer not, only the question answer that question <laughs> and that question only yes because uh, you can leave it open or or you offer too much information yes one thing to do is if it's a yes or no question look you know there, there's ways that you're going to be taught on how to answer questions some questions ain't yes or no mm -hmm. i mean you you're just not going to be able to answer like that but the courses will help you with that and experience will help you and oh if it's a major case you know if it's a murder double homicide um, if it's something major you work with the prosecutors and you work with the district attorney to see what angle and what they really want you because they'll go at your report and like I'm going to I'm going to ask you these and make sure you have it because it's in your report and then understanding or or anticipating what the defense is going to ask so there is some preparation that goes in there but like like um Sergeant Torres saying you experience will help you the classes that we take in the academy and afterwards um, because we do offer that some of it's online some of it you can take classroom but it helps you prepare for going to even traffic court, going to municipal court, going to you know district court, or going in any kind of court setting. It helps you be prepared. You mentioned the continuing education, and you may have mentioned this, and I just didn't catch it. Is there a formal like every five years or X number of years that you have to say retake a written test or? redo your t close or something or so things. every every um two years you have to have a certain block of continuing education hours which are t cold training hours that are commissioned by the state and there is a slew of training that you have to do for your certification so when we graduated the police academy we got the basic peace officer we've got a certificate that says i have passed the basic peace officer requirements I can now um, be a Texas peace officer. When you move along your career, there are different levels of certification that you can obtain. You can go from basic to intermediate to what you <coughs> basic. basic, intermediate, master. master. There's master. Gosh, it seems like there's three. Oh, it is basic, intermediate, master. Um, and you have to have so many training hours throughout that time span. So once you get so many years as a law enforcement officer and you have so much training hours, whether you went to SWAT school, you went to firearms instructor school, you went to all this instructor, you went to child death investigation, there's different, there's a whole list of them. That goes towards your training hour bank of what is always accumulating under your license. And when you, when you, meet a certain criteria of a license, then you can now obtain your intermediate cert certification because to, in order to obtain your intermediate or next level, then you have to get certain core, they're called core courses that you have to get, you know, different levels of, of training, in, how to do crime scene investigation <clears throat> at our intermediate level. Um, there's intermediate Spanish that you have to know certain Spanish um, and then there's different um, types of, uh, gosh, what was that other woman to do with like uh, family violence or things like that? There's a, there's different categories. You have to make sure you check crisis those boxes, crisis intervention. You have to check off those boxes. And once you get them all and there's a certain time period, then you can now get your intermediate. And then it starts again for your, for your master. I know so, for the master is if you don't have any college, then at 12 years, if you want your master, you got to have at least 3,300 hours of training. That gives you an idea for the master mm -hmm. officer one. Um, but but every uh, every two years, and it starts in a September one. Yeah, starts September one. Every two years, you have to have 40 hours of some sort of T. Cole continuing education. 40 hours. And and our training unit keeps up with it, mm -hmm. and they make sure that you're in compliance with that, uh, with that, you know, with our regu requirement, with the regulations. Yes. Mm -hmm. And if you're lacking some hours, then they'll put you in training. They'll uh, send you some kind of training. They'll make sure you have the core tr classes first. And then anything else you want after that, depending on your job, yeah. 
you know, what unit you're in, what right. division you're in. That's the training you're going to get at the time. And for example, this last cycle that ended um, end of <clears throat> August, because a new cycle started September 1, I had to have 20 something hours because being in my role, you know, I don't need to go to the other ones. I have a master peace officer, but I still have to get 40. I needed 20 or 19 or 20 some hours. So I got assigned T. Cole classes that, that they said they would get credit for. And they're more leadership roles and they're more supervi supervisory, supervisory, yeah, supervision roles of things that I do and things that I interact with. So I got it done and, and it happened, but all of our officers have to maintain their 40 hours every two years. And like me, I have my masterpiece officer also with the bachelor's degree. Mm -hmm. And I just have to get 40 hours and I get hundreds of hours a year with my SWAT training. Mm -hmm and uh other training that the department gives us throughout the year so uh, my hours are always good and emergency driving we do that once either once every other year or we do it once a year some sort of training on emergency driving and that's the fun stuff of where we get to drive fast <clears throat> put on our sirens and in our lights and get the training that it takes to do that because you don't just jump in a car and go you have to get the training and how I to just, do it safely I just did that last week and it was yeah. fun yeah but yeah um when i was in investigations for those eight years i was able to get my bachelor's degree uh with you know i had my wife there to support me um and she also has her bachelor's degree in business administration so so she she was able to help me along and get me through it and that's while you were working right yep I was able, the police department allowed me to, if I had a in-person class, I was able to go to that class. Sometimes I'll be in uniform, sometimes I'll be in my shirt and tie and my badge and gun, but I was allowed to go take that class. And one, one of the main reasons was it better it helped the department. Mm -hmm. So they allowed me to go to class. Right. Does that answer kind of what you were um, looking for, Kathy? Yes, it, it certainly does. You all have been a wealth of information this morning. Um, we thank you for that. Any closing comments you'd like to um, give our students? I'll let you in, but I'll go first. Okay. So I would like to tell the students that no matter where you're from, how you grew up, if you want to be a police officer, it can be done. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a rough upbringing. You know, and but this is what I wanted to do. And every day I would come leave work and there was a police officer sitting at Paddy Water Stadium. I would tell myself, I'm gonna be there. And That's I'm good. there. You can do it. It's good. Um, and what I would say is, you know, there's already when I started in 2000, I was one of four female officers. And 20 years later, there's about 17, 18 female officers. And kind of along the same lines of what Sergeant Torres is saying, you know, I didn't grow up wanting to be a police officer because I didn't think you could. And it wasn't until I came here as a civilian <coughs> that I saw the four other female officers and I went, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. And that got, that piqued my interest. And then I was able to look at reports, see reports, and then do a ride along. And then I feel I, feel, I felt compelled and drawn to that uh, career to turn around and serve the community. And yes, there were obstacles along the way, but I was my only person that was gonna stop me. And so I made up my mind that the challenges that came, the agility course, the police academy, the field training you have to go through after you get out of the police academy, that all of that, I was gonna give it my all. I was gonna try really hard and I was gonna do my best. And literally I told myself, they're gonna have to fire me because I'm not quitting. <laughs> and so I'm glad I've had that mentality ever since. And I'm very proud to be a part of an agency that sponsored me, that supported me through my family also supported me throughout. I, I um, when I started, I had a four-year-old and um, he's now 26. So there are challenges and things that you have to maneuver to get to your end goal. And having the support system of the department and of my family 
is the only reason how I was able to do it. So, um, and it's it's been very rewarding and fulfilling. So if that's something you want to do and you want to be in these type of roles. Um, you've got to start somewhere and and always remembering the decisions you make on a Friday night, on a Sunday night, during the week that you know is against your moral compass of what you know is right and wrong. Those can come back and keep you from um, obtaining your end goal of what you want to be uh, when you grow up, because believe it or not, we were high schoolers. And uh, we always thought, or I know I always thought that eh, being an adult is so far away. But no, the decisions you make now is what's going to affect your future tomorrow. Again, wonderful closing comments from both of you. Um, so again, thank you, Elaine and Daniel, for taking time to share about your personal, educational, and career experiences. Um, we really appreciate hearing this information about a career in the law enforcement field and in particular your openness and the tips and information that you've shared about how to be successful, um, actually being successful on many levels. Uh, we want to thank those that are joining us online and a reminder that this recording will be posted to the YouTube channel um, that we have set up for career speakers so you can view it again and also. Um, Feel free to share this with others that um, who might be interested in this career in law enforcement. So again, we, we wish everyone um, a good day. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you.